I'm Greg Wheatley, and my guest today on Inside Wheaton is William Cleary. Bill is uh, just finishing a master's degree, has just finished actually here at Wheaton College as we sit here in the early goings of the summer, a master's in marriage and family therapy uh, and counseling. Bill, it's great to welcome you to Inside Wheaton. Thank you for having me, Greg. It's a you pleasure feeling, being uh, you feeling breathing room relief? Uh. Yes, <laughs> yes. There's a, a short period here where I, I'm able to relax and um, take it in a little bit and then uh, hit the ground running and start my career. In just a couple weeks. Yeah, um, and we'll talk about that. I, you, I know you've got some exciting things lined up. We'll talk about where you've been and, and, and where you're going. Tell me about uh, being a part of the master's program at Wheaton College, uh, where you came from, where you did your undergrad, just your journey to Wheaton and beyond. Sure, sure. I um, Well, here at Wheaton, the, the marriage and family therapy program, it's, it's, I was part of the first year cohort. Um, so it's a brand new program. Um, Explain what cohort means for people that sure uh, your class or your group. You, you go know, that, through the whole time with one group of mm-hmm. students. Yep, right? okay. there's uh, 17 of us that graduated, and so you know, day one I was with them, and we kind of journeyed through the whole program, and um, it's been very quick, very quick journey, but uh, also a very fun one as well, and. Um, Originally, I, I, I did my undergrad at uh, Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma. I'm from um, Collinsville, Oklahoma, which is a small town of about 5,000 people. And um, I graduated from Oral Roberts uh, in 2006. And my degree there was pastoral Christian ministries with a, a minor in missions. And um, really felt you know, a call to the mission field, particularly in, in Japan. And um, I've been honored and blessed to travel to several countries throughout the world, but uh, Japan really um, gripped my heart, and I, I just developed a passion for studying the language, studying the culture. Um, so I, I served there on the, the missions field with the IPHC Church for um, six years before transitioning back and um, deciding I, I wanted to, to further my education, and particularly in in the area of counseling, so how did that transition happen? Because it, I, I would assume originally, were you headed towards a more traditional pastoral role? Was that was that your thought at first? Um, kind of. I I just knew I, I wanted to to help people. I know it sounds wonderful, um, but you know it wasn't that clean cut. I just knew that you know I wanted to contribute and be a part of a community, be a part of something that was some action that was going on, something that was happening, and um, throughout my time. Uh, working in Japan, I wore several hats. I was um, serving in youth ministry, um, working in our, a small church in Tokyo, and um, I was also teaching English to children and also corporate employees and uh, working in downtown Tokyo. And through through that work, through interacting with people on a daily basis, I just I just saw the need for mental health um, in in Japan and. Um, you know, just people who, who really needed, um, just guidance or assistance or, um, and I felt that my current qualifications were, um, lacking to some degree. And so I I really, um, felt the draw towards counseling in that sense. So tell me, let's talk about that a little bit, um, Bill, in terms of the church Mm -hmm. and mental health and counseling, um, what do you see in the, in the current landscape of the evangelical church, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of ability to cope with with things that are uh, mental health issues? Sure. Well, that's a really tough question. Um, and, you know, Japan is, is an interesting culture. Um, here we're ind- individualistic. There it's a collectivist society. So, um, you know, how much you reveal to people you don't know very well is... is, is um, it looks a lot different than it does here, and and that certainly takes place within the church as well. Um, actually, I was last year I was working with um, HDI Humanitarian Disaster Institute here on campus, um, and they, you know, as part of a a project that interviewed pastors after the tsunami and the earthquake in in Japan, and and how the church, you know, rallied and came together and and really involved themselves in the community and. You know, before the the tsunami or the earthquake, um, there wasn't a lot of community involvement. There wasn't a lot of uh, joining together with other churches. So um, 
you know, and, and, and for the church, this was kind of a new area to kind of branch out. Um, along with that, there are people who lost their homes, lost family members, lost friends, um, had to attend a, a different school, you, you know, just um, I think even now there's still around 200,000 people who are living in temporary housing. So a lot of people were traumatized and really affected by that event. Um, and so that's certainly an area where the church can contribute, um, you know, working with trauma victims, um, you know, having conversations with people. It's nothing that has to be super therapeutic in nature, but just sitting down with people and having a conversation. And I, I think that's where really where evangelism happens in Japan. It's not the, the mm-hmm. crusades or street evangelism, but it's really just sitting down with people and having a conversation. Mm-hmm. There was for a long time here, and maybe still is, um, a sort of stigma attached to mental health issues, I think, and particularly in the church among Christians, it was seen as, uh, well, I, I don't want anybody to know that maybe I'm seeing a counselor, you know. Right. Is, is that still a hurdle to get over, or are we, are we better at that? Um, it, it still is a hurdle. I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a shame-based society, and so, you know, they view mental health as an illness, a sickness, something that's wrong with, with them or a family member. So um, it's it, it's kind of kept behind closed doors, and, and it's not talked about much. Mm-hmm. Here we're very open about it. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing my counselor, and we talked about mm-hmm. this today. But but in Japan, it, it definitely is, is quite different. But I feel like, um, you know, mental health and counseling, it's becoming more and more open as people are seeing the the certainly the need for it, where – medication is is not helping or it's 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 not enough or um you know where counseling would be certainly a better better way to approach um, let me ask you about the wheaton program um the masters and there is a mm-hmm. doctoral program here but you'd be most familiar at least so far with the masters you going yes. for that doctorate by the way <laughs> uh someday <laughs> too early to say as soon as this my wife a, gives me the okay this isn't a good time to ask <laughs> um tell me tell me your experience with the ma program here and and uh some of the strengths of it? Maybe somebody's listening who's considering it? Sure. I, I'm very excited, very happy to talk about the program. Um, again, we came in first year cohort or the group that uh, the first class to, to study marriage and family therapy um, at Wheaton. And so, um, you know, part of that was working out the kinks. Part of that was um, joining with the group together to, um, you know, make this the program that it is. And, um, you know, we're, we're learning a lot of, you know, rigorous academic training and theory and, um, practice and everything. But the second year of the program, um, incorporates an internship. So I've been in a family counseling center, um, nearby and, and logging hours every week. I work about 20 to 25 hours a week doing that. And, um, the thing I really love about the Wheaton program, maybe that would distinguish it from, from other you know secular schools is that it really integrates faith with practice. Um, so we've been learning a lot about um, how to incorporate our faith in in, in our practice as well. So is the uh, the center where you're interning a, a Christian uh, place? I mean, is that a, a place where you would would have opportunity to do direct integration with your faith? It's it's a government run agency. Um, so you know explicitly we we don't say we're Christian or or you know, um, advertise ourselves like that. But if, you know, if I have a client who comes in and, you know, they say they don't have any support from family, they don't have any friends, um, but that God is the only strength of their life, then, then I'll explore that with them. And I feel like you're free to do that as as the occasion. Sure. Sure. Spirituality is, is a very big part of, um, you know, every individual's life. And so we, we certainly explore those areas. And I feel like with my background, that's a strength of mine. I can, I can work with people to, to kind of dig in. In the ideal world, Bill, would, would, a, would a pastor of a church be equipped to do this? Or do you see the model being more uh, a pastor is a pastor, and then you refer to a Christian counselor? How, how, how would that be in the ideal world for you? Sure. I, well, I, I think the training is different. I think the the area of um, working with people, the approach is a little bit different. Um, there's certainly things where I might refer someone to a pastor. Um, but I think that um, what is synonymous is that, you know, pastors and um, mental health practitioners alike, um, you know, we, we learn 
to exercise empathy with with people we meet with. And so hearing someone's story, seeking to understand it and coming alongside them and, and aiding them and um you know, whatever struggle or whatever difficulty they're going through, that's that's synonymous, you know. Yeah. Um, but again, it, th- there, I think there's two different approaches from a pastoral perspective and as well from a, a mental health practitioner's perspective. Let me ask you, uh, dig in a little bit to sure. what you do in terms of family, marriage and family, which seems to be your, your specialty. Mm-hmm. Um, what, are some <clears throat> of the, what are some of the pressures that families are under that, that you're trying to deal with, Mm -hmm. help them cope with? Sure. Well, there's a variety of pressures. And um, in the MFT program at Wheaton, we we really hone in on a systemic approach. We look at at everything. We don't just look at that individual um, within the family, but we look at, at the family system. We look at the society, the environment. And so, you know, if I have a a 16-year-old boy that I'm working with um, who's struggling, you know, to focus or, or get his grades up in school. I'm also looking at what's happening at home. You know, what's the family environment like? Um, and it's interesting because when you get the family to come in and you're working with everyone at at one time, you you really see that, oh, okay, here's some issues where maybe the child's struggling to to get along with dad. They're just not hitting on the, off on the same page. And so um, you work with that and you, you kind of – you know, you find that once the relationship improves between um, the parent subsystem and the child subsystem mm-hmm. that, you know, for, for whatever reason, the grades improve, the grades go up. And it's, it's, not a, it's not a perfect system, but, you know, we try to consider everything. We're not just looking at one aspect of that. So, Is it hard to get, you know, I'm envisioning your, your scenario there, say a 16-year-old boy who is sort of the presenting issue, right? Right, right. Uh, when, when those parents hear, hey, we'd like you all to come in here, mm-hmm. does that engender a little bit of fear and defensiveness usually? or uh, it, it can, um, but I find that, you know, when, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm sitting there talking with clients and, and I say, you know, I think it would be beneficial if, if everyone came in today, you know, we just had a conversation. Usually they're pretty open to that. You know, they don't come in defensive. Um, they certainly have their side of the story. But, you know, I, I could see a session um, with a client where, where they're both going at it the whole time, um, you know, with the family. And they're all sharing their sides. And nothing gets resolved. But they come back the next week and they say, this week was much better. Um, so you don't know why. But just, you know, creating that space where people can um, be heard. Mm-hmm. And also to listen. I think listening is a very hard thing for us in in this um, society that we live in. And so um, when someone feels like they're heard, somehow that allows them to put down their guard and and, and allows things to change. So, What would you say to the, a, a person or a or couple or family mm-hmm. who might be hearing this and thinking, you know, I think, I think we'd benefit from counseling, but it's just too intimidating. You know, yeah. um, how do you encourage them to, to get beyond that and, and maybe go seek someone out? Sure. Um, one thing I find is that people often remark on how I, I take a non-judgmental stance with them, that when, when I'm sitting with them in the room, I'm trying to hear their story. You know, if you sit with people long enough, you realize everyone has a reason for believing what they believe mm-hmm. or saying what they say. And I, I think that... Um, Sometimes for people, the hesitation is, okay, how's this person going to think of me? Are they going to judge me? Are they going to try to get me to, you know, um, are they going to partner with my spouse? You know, if it's a couple, yeah, take, or, take their side, yeah, against, take their mine, side yeah. against mine. And, 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 uh, and so I think that, um, yeah, I think that once you sit there and uh, once you finally get through the door, everything's okay usually. Um, but also, you know, I, in a first session, I'll sit with people and I'll say, hey, listen, this is, this is just uh, an opportunity for us to get to know each other and to see if this is a good fit. Mm-hmm. And if, if the clients come through the door and they say, you know what, this isn't a good fit for me, then, then I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that therapy is productive when you have that connection and you're able to work together. It's kind of a, a collaborative approach, so to speak. And so I think that, that once they get through the door, then you know, it's not as bad as or intimidating as they think. So. Some of the old, uh, and maybe I'm just old enough to, to 
be more in this category, but I think some of the old stereotypes are still there too of mm. sort of the uh, Freudian approach and uh, mm-hmm. here, get over there, sit on that couch and you're going to reveal every last dark secret about <laughs> yourself before you leave this office. Right. I, I, I'm assuming that is a, that's a caricature, that's a stereotype. Isn't it? it is, and, and I think that the world of counseling has certainly um, has transformed over the years. Um, for example, my seat is no more elevated than, than the, the position of the client's seat. Um, we're looking eye to eye. Um, you know, clients are sitting next to each other. We're, we're bringing in the whole family. It's not just one-on-one. Um, and again, it's, um, it's not, uh, you know, I have all the answers. I'm giving advice. It's not like that at all. I'm, I'm really seeking to understand them. And I think as, as, as people are able to open up and share these, you know, these things that they've been wrestling with or struggling with for, for weeks or months or years that for, you know, somehow they, they find some clarity or find some, uh, maybe a different perspective and, and have motivation to change. So, well, what's next for you, uh, after you, after you take a deep breath and, uh, after this master's uh, journey, what, uh, what's next for you? Mm-hmm. I'm looking at, um, working for a private practice, uh, in the area. I've, I've had some offers and, um, and so, you know, my wife and I eventually want to transition back into Japan, um, work in the mental health field there. And so, um, you know, but I, I, I want to get my training. I, I really want to be licensed as, um, a marriage and family therapist. And so that's my first goal and eventually transition back into Japan is, is, uh, kind of down the road, maybe a year or two. I'm not quite sure yet, but um, just see how things go. It's great to have you here. Good to meet you. Congratulations on your master's. And, Thank you, uh, Greg. God's best uh, as you move ahead from here. Thank you. William Cleary, uh, having just finished his master's in marriage and family therapy here in the program at Wheaton College. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in that program, let me encourage you to get in touch at wheaton.edu, where you'll get all the information about uh, that program, master's as well as uh, the PsyD. I think it's, is that right? The uh, doctoral program is called... A side E, right? Yes, yes. About that and uh, the other programs here as well. Wheaton.edu. For Inside Wheaton, I'm Greg Wheaton.